So let's get started here. Um, so what you're looking at here is a cranking compression waveform. <clears throat> Basically, uh, this is just like a normal compression test where you would hold your foot to the floor, crank the car over, and take some compression readings. Now, there's not a lot of information to be gleaned here uh, other than the fact that the car is making good compression. So I'm going to put some uh, measuring tools on here. And the first thing I'm going to put on here is a cursor. Uh, and I'm just going to have it set up at zero PSI. So I'm just going to type zero PSI in here. And that takes us down to the zero PSI line. And if I want to look at how much compression this engine is making, I'll pull the second cursor down, kind of align it with the tops or the tips uh, of the waveform. And I can see that this car is making about 130 PSI compression consistently. A couple of things that are different here from just a regular compression uh, test. And the first thing is you ignore the first waveform. Uh, you don't know where the cylinder is when the engine starts to crank. So it really doesn't matter too much. Generally, this first pulse will be low. This one's kind of an exception and it's up there with the rest of them. The second thing is really what you're looking for here is are each compression strokes or are the compression strokes consistent? If you take a look at the uh, waveform that I've got here on the screen, you can see that in each case we're hitting about the same amount of pressure, which is a good indicator that the cylinder is consistently filling and compressing the uh, air fuel mixture the same amount each time and that's what you want. <clears throat> if you were to get variations in compression through here and you, you wouldn't see this necessarily with a regular compression gauge but let's put some uh, let's say this one was up here and this one was down here and this one was up here as kind of a hypothetical then you would know that this cylinder is inconsistently filling. Typically on a cranking engine, that's a valve action or a valve sealing problem. So without too much work here, you would know uh, right off the hop that you've got an engine mechanical problem. The second thing here, uh, where you can see this inconsistent compression, you would never see that uh, with a regular compression gate because it would just pump up. So that's a cranking compression waveform and it's basically just a compression test. I wouldn't necessarily use this as a baseline test uh, for running compression or anything like that, but it does show you what the compression ratio of the engine is doing uh, in crank mode. Now from there, we're going to run into a basic uh, running compression waveform. So I'm just gonna open up another file here. And I'm going to minimize that box to kind of get it out of the road for the time being. <clears throat> and <clears throat> this is a typical running compression waveform from a known good vehicle. Now, because we're using the Pico here, I'm going to start to put um, some measuring devices on this thing so you guys can kind of see what's going on here. So what I'm going to do in the corner of my screen here, I've got some degree cursors. And the idea here is for you to take these cursors and chunk out 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation, which will give you the four strokes for this cylinder. So if you take this high peak as your compression peak, then when it appears again over here on the right, you know the engine has gone through or rotated through 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation. So I'm going to take the first degree marker at this peak, the peak on the left. And I'm going to set the second 720 degree ruler at the second peak. So now basically what I've done here is I've staked out 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation. And then the next thing I'm gonna do here is I'm going to add some rulers to divide this up into the four strokes. If you're not running a Pico or something of that nature, 
then you're not going to be able to do this in quite the same way that I'm doing. So you're going to need to do a little bit of math here. And the math is pretty simple. <clears throat> we, we measure uh, events like ignition timing and valve timing and that kind of stuff in degrees of rotation. Well, a scope's not really set up for that. So what the scope does is uh, it gives you time in milliseconds, and we don't want that. We want to talk degrees of rotation. So I'm going to give you a couple of formulas here to show you how to do this if you're not running with a Pico scope. So the first thing I want you to do, or the first thing I'm going to do here, <coughs> is mark out my 720. So this is 720 degrees, and we're going to call that time x. The next thing you do, sorry, 720 degrees, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take our, we're going to take our time cursors and we're going to put them in here. So I've got 720 degrees of rotation staked out. That's taking 197 milliseconds. So to, to, to get <coughs> degrees per millisecond, which is really what you want, you're going to take 720 divided by time x, and that'll give you degrees of rotation per millisecond of time. Okay. Now, I don't have to do that because I'm running uh, the Pico scope here. And it will do all that math for me, but the math is pretty simple. So if you take 720 divided into 197 milliseconds, um, I'm not going to do the math, but you kind of get the idea here. So that isn't all that hard to do. Just going to get rid of these cursors for a second and get back to our basic waveform. So you can see here that I've got my <coughs> 720 staked out. Uh, I've added four. Uh, rulers, four strokes. Each ruler represents uh, 180 degrees of rotation, so 180, 360, 540, and 720. <clears throat> and what I want to do here is go through the uh, strokes with you, and then we'll talk about the waveform itself. But basically, the four strokes are pretty straightforward. So this would be the, typically be the power stroke, but because this cylinder is not running, uh, we're gonna call it the expansion stroke. The next stroke is the exhaust stroke, then comes the intake stroke, and finally the compression stroke. Pretty straightforward. Up here I would have a top dead center, down here, bottom dead center, up the top dead center, back down to bottom dead center, and back up the top dead center again. So pretty simple to understand where the pressure peaks and that kind of stuff are coming from. So let's talk about the compression stroke, or sorry, let's talk about the expansion stroke first. So that's this guy, the piston's on its way down. We have compressed our air fuel mixture because the valves are closed. So we've compressed it in this case, um, Just let me move some stuff around here. <clears throat> In this case, the air fuel mixture is being compressed to about uh, 67, 68 PSI. Obviously, because the engine is running, compression is going to be a lot lower here. Uh, the reason for the lower compression the main reason is we've shut the air off into this thing, so there's not as much air going into it, so compression is lower. <clears throat> as the piston comes down here, this screen here, my marker back. So as the piston comes down here, we compress the mixture going up 
to the top of the compression stroke. Now we're coming down on the expansion stroke. And as we go down, there's a zero line here that's kind of hard to see. So I'm going to put a second cursor on this. And I'm going to move it to the zero pressure point. And how this works. Pointer back. Anything above this line is pressure. Anything below this line is vacuum. So you can see as the piston comes down on the expansion stroke, we hit the zero point or atmospheric, and then we pull the, the cylinder down into a vacuum. And right about here, we see that the cylinder, the vacuum in the cylinder goes away. Now the, the piston is still going down. In fact, the piston goes down until we reach this point. So what's happened here, this event is called EVO or exhaust valve opening. And so as we decompress the mixture, we go past zero, we drag the cylinder into a vacuum, the exhaust valve opens up, we break the vacuum, and pressure in the cylinder is allowed to go back up to atmospheric. During the exhaust stroke, the intake valve is closed, the exhaust valve is open, right about here somewhere, we have valve overlap, the intake valve is going to open just ahead of top dead center, and the exhaust valve is going to close slightly after top dead center. That pulls the cylinder down into another vacuum right, on the intake stroke. So we're going to call this the intake pocket, and we're going to call this guy the expansion pocket. So the intake stroke, uh, the intake valve is open for the whole stroke. We hit bottom dead center, the piston turns around, and we start to uh, go up in the cylinder, but the intake valve is still open, so we really can't pressurize it yet. Right about here somewhere, which is where our trace starts to change direction or starts to curve up, this is where the intake valve closes. So the two measurable events on this waveform that I use are exhaust valve opening and intake valve closing. Those are measurable, measurable events. They're very clearly defined in the waveform and they allow me to measure cam timing and things like that. If the vehicle only has one camshaft like a pushrod engine, then you only have to measure one event. However, if it's a dual cam engine, or the, or the intake camshaft and the exhaust camshaft are moved independently of each other, then <clears throat> you, you have to measure them both because it's possible for only one camshaft uh, to be out of time, as opposed to two of them. So I'm gonna just get rid of my marks on the screen here again, and I'll stop at this point and, and just uh, give you guys a couple of seconds. Are there any questions at this point? And if you, if you have them, just um, type them into the, the chat box, and I'll try and answer them uh, out loud as best I can. Okay, looks like everybody's clear on that, so we'll keep moving. <clears throat> now, when you're analyzing uh, the waveform, some things to look for. Going to put some more uh, measurements on here. I'm going to move this bottom cursor down so that it intersects the lowest intersects the lowest part of the waveform. So you can see here that I've got this lined up exactly with my uh, expansion pocket and my intake pocket. Now on a on a car or a vehicle with um, a single camshaft and non-variable valve timing, those two pockets should be at the same height or the same depth. If you're running a, a vehicle with variable valve timing or something like that, then you may want to use uh, a companion cylinder as a, 
as a known good and judge your pockets uh, based on that. Now, when you're looking at these pockets, first thing you can do here is you can measure vacuum. So I'm just gonna move this back down to zero. And I'm showing about 10 point, uh, 10.2 negative PSI. Uh, in the vacuum world, two PSI or one PSI negative equals two inches of vacuum. So this cylinder is pulling about 20 inches of vacuum, which is fine. And then <clears throat> not only do we want to check that the cylinder is making good vacuum, but we also want to make sure that the two pockets are at the same height. Now, if the two pockets are at different heights, it's usually an indicator that there's something wrong. If this pocket is high, so it's up here somewhere, that generally means you've got a, a valve timing issue with the exhaust valve. If it's low, down here somewhere, that generally means you've got a leakage somewhere. So the cylinder's not sealing properly, so when, it, when the cylinder goes up on the compression stroke, some of the charge leaks out. And then when you decompress it, it actually decompresses to a lower level because there's less in the cylinder than what you started out with. So high pocket, valve timing, low pocket, typically means you've got a leak somewhere. <clears throat> the next thing we look at is... Uh, what I call the, the symmetry or, the, or is the peak symmetrical. And all that means basically is it compressing and decompressing at the same rate. You can see here that the time between my center line going up and the time between my center line coming down are about the same, which indicates that this cylinder is filling or sorry, compressing and decompressing at the same rate, which is exactly what we want. The next thing we're gonna do here is measure valve timing. Okay, and to do that, we're going to use our timing cursors. So the first event we're going to measure is exhaust valve opening. We pull, excuse me, we pull the cursor over, set cursor one on the 180 degree mark. And then we pull cursor two over to about the bottom of the curve here. So we wanna, we wanna be as accurate as we can and catch this thing just about where it changes direction. You can see here from my uh, scope shot that that EVO, exhaust valve opening on this particular engine is at around the 58 degree mark. So the EVO or exhaust valve opening on this engine is 58 degrees before bottom dead center at the end of the expansion stroke. Typically, vehicles with fifth, fixed valve timing, the EVO is somewhere between about 35 and 60 degrees before bottom dead center. And the next thing we're gonna do, whoops, back to where it was here. The next thing we're gonna do is measure IVC. So again, we're gonna set one cursor at the 540 degree mark, which is the end of the intake stroke. And we're gonna move our cursor till we catch the trace line, just about where it starts to bend up. Somewhere in there. And you can see here that IVC or intake valve closing is happening at 47 degrees after bottom dead center of the compression stroke. And again, uh, normally, intake valve closing is generally between about 40 and 60 degrees after bottom dead center on an engine with fixed valve timing. Okay. I'm just going to take my markers off here, that kind of stuff, and I'm going to stop here again. If there's any questions, uh, I'll take a second and answer them before we move on. Uh, into some of the case studies and stuff that I've got for you here. Okay, so 
now that we kind of sorry i've got a question here did you find the pico cursors accurate so the question is did did do i find the piece the pico cursors accurate yeah the, the, the cursors are very accurate because it's just it's just math now um, placing them can be a bit of a challenge so there's a couple of things that i do here in order to help me place them better so what i'm going to do here is i'm actually going to zoom in on this waveform a little bit uh, tighter there's another question popped up i'll get to it in a second all right so i'm going to place the first cursor the, the, the tighter I zoom on this thing, the easier it is to place. So that looks pretty close to top dead center there. And then I'm going to place the second one here. Okay. And then I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Okay. So now that I've got my uh, cursors placed, this is just basically chunking out a 720 degree chunk of the screen is all it's doing and then when i bring in these time cursors i can be very accurate with them now there's a couple of things here and the first one is it's it's really hard or it can be kind of hard especially on waveforms that aren't as clearly defined as this one to tell where these changes in direction actually took place so one of the things that that, I, that helps me after i've got my cursors in place my 720 degree cursors i'm going i zoom out a little bit and you notice how much more definition i've got on the change of directions here now that i've taken a bigger look at it so i'm going to place this cursor as close as i can get it to that inverted peak there and then I'm going to zoom back in okay and I can do the same thing on the other side so getting the cursors to be um, accurate I mean it's, it's nothing more than math I find that the, the, the cursors on the Pico are much easier to control than um, a lot of the other cursors on some of the other scan tools we use um, we use autel sorry not scan tools but scope we use autel the autel scope and we have it on both the tablet and pc on the tablet the cursors are very hard to control but on the pc you can use a mouse and they work pretty good and they've they've actually copied a lot of the pico features so that's um so it's also easy to do right uh the next question i have here is can it be used to verify cylinder deactivation and cylinder leak down when running uh absolutely um i can show you that uh in a clip that we did the actual waveform changes dramatically between a cylinder that's working and uh one that isn't if you remind me at the end, I'll go back. So I have to get out of this. Um, I actually have to go into a PowerPoint presentation that I have to find that. And uh, that means I got to drop this screen and go to the other one. But if you want to remind me of that cylinder deactivation question at the end of this, I will go back in and show it to you. And can you use the vertical zoom feature? I'm not sure what uh, you mean there, Daniel, by vertical zoom. Um, when I'm using the Pico, I don't use uh, anything other than the uh, magnifying glass on the left so that I can draw the box and the 100% button. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I, I, can, I can change the... Uh, so what Daniel is asking is, can I expand or shrink the waveform yeah if i go in here to my scale offset buttons <clears throat> in the bottom of the pico i can make the the waveform bigger or smaller depending on what i'm trying to do okay um 
I generally don't do that when I'm doing pressure transducer stuff, but it, it, it is definitely available to you. Okay. Perfect. Okay, any other questions? Um, yeah, the change of direction, you can magnify it that way too. I hadn't really thought of that, but um, both work. Cool. So well, let's get to our uh, first problem car waveform. Just going to shut these down, get rid of the cursors. The first one is uh, pretty simple. Uh, I believe this was a, a GM truck. Uh, that had a dead miss. So I'm just going to blow this waveform up so we can get a little bit better look at it. I mean, compared to what we've seen, you don't have to, to even look at it too close to, to figure out that this ain't got a definite problem. So I'm going to bring in my measuring cursors. I just want to answer one more question. Uh, I've got a question here from Nick. I think it's Nick Duncan. It said, uh, I said earlier, you don't use the cranking captures. Uh, I use the cranking captures, but I don't use them a, a lot other than basic compression check and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> it, it's kind of hard with that waveform to pick anything else out because the, the engine the, the pumping action of the engine is very um, inefficient at cranking speeds. What we do use at cranking speeds more than an in-cylinder pressure transducer, and this class is not about, um, I, did, I wanted to keep this class very narrow on the in-cylinder stuff, is we use a uh, vacuum transducer like a first look, and you can see a lot clearer whether the engine's pumping properly at idle, or sorry, during cranking, than you can with a cranking waveform. Now, obviously, if you've got a cylinder that's down on compression or something like that, you're going to pick it up uh, with the in-cylinder. But until the engine's actually running, the, there's a lot more diagnostic data available to you with a running waveform than there is uh, with a cranking waveform. Okay. The other thing on the cranking side of things that we look at is the um, consistency of the peaks. Obviously, if they're not consistent, then you know the cylinder isn't filling consistently, which would lead you to, to valve issues, that kind of thing. Now, <clears throat> this is a dead miss. You can see here, uh, I've staked out my 720. I'm going to turn my rulers on. And I'm going to bring down some measuring cursors here. Now, this is the compression peak. It's sitting in at 3 PSI, which is nothing. So it doesn't take a genius to figure out that this thing's got a severe cylinder ceiling problem. Uh, I'm going to bring a second cursor in here and just kind of fool around with this a little bit. Okay, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go in and measure vacuum on this thing. Sort of, this thing is pulling about 15 inches of vacuum uh, on its intake stroke, which would indicate to me that the in, or sorry, the exhaust valve is sealing reasonably well. Without taking this vehicle apart, um, I would suspect that I've got a problem with a leaking intake valve or something like that. Obviously, there would be more testing required to kind of pin it down. And at, at, at that point on this vehicle, we didn't go much further on it because there really was um, no need. It didn't have any compression. Uh, we can tell that it does have some sealing ability uh, through the uh, exhaust valve because when the cylinder is going down on the intake stroke, typically the intake valve is open, the exhaust valve is closed. So you're actually uh, creating vacuum by sealing the cylinder with the exhaust valve and then pulling air in through the closed throttle plate. 
So we'll take a second. Um, again, I'll take a second here, and if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them before we move on to the next waveform. Okay, let me get rid of this stuff. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one, does the cylinder engine, uh, cylinder slash engine temperature affect the waveform results? A little bit um, in that, <clears throat> with this waveform which is typically done uh, at idle speed for for most of it if the engine is cold the throttle will be open more which will let more air into the engine so temperature does have a little bit of an effect on it more air into the engine means higher compression you can actually see this if you let the thing run uh, while the vehicle warms up the compression will actually come down 10 or 15 psi as the engine warms up and the throttle closes down. So does cylinder and engine temperature have an effect on the waveform results? Sure it does, okay. Uh, Andre asked, can this be done with an Autel lab scope? Uh, absolutely. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed on the latest update from Autel is they have started to add these degree cursors to their waveforms, making it, um, much easier to use for this. You don't have to do the math as much. And then Blake asked, where was the transducer placed to perform the, the testing? In this case, it was placed in the spark plug hole. Okay. All of our, for all of the waveforms that you're gonna see here today, the uh, pressure transducer was screwed into the, to the spark plug hole, just like you would with a normal compression gauge. Go to the next file here. Get rid of my markers. Okay, so what you're looking at here uh, is a Dodge Hemi with a with a misfire at higher RPM. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and we'll put our measuring devices back on. Okay, we've had um, several of these. They're, you know, they've, they've got some known problems. I'm just gonna put my zero line on here as well. All right, so there's zero, and this thing's making about uh, 65 psi compression. Now this was obviously taken at idle. <clears throat> Couple of things here, so we know what it's doing for pressure. I'm just going to come down here and take a look at my pockets. They're close, but this pocket is a little bit high. Um, I wouldn't necessarily. Uh, condemn anything at this point. However, uh, if you take a look at the tower, it's pretty symmetrical. Comes down, we can actually measure valve timing here as well if we're interested. We can see that the EVO is in and around the 56 degree mark uh, before bottom dead center, which is not too bad. However, if you take a look at the exhaust stroke, let's get rid of these for a second. If you take a look at the exhaust stroke, right here, and I'm just going to zoom in on that. <clears throat> 
So you can see here from my drawing, or from my arrow, let me remove that arrow and put it in a better spot. So what you can see right here is at about 10 degree before top dead center mark, this cylinder starts to make pressure. Now it doesn't make a whole lot, but we're actually producing about two and a half to three PSI here before the end of the exhaust stroke, which really shouldn't happen because if you think about where the valves are on this thing, as the um, as the piston goes up on the exhaust stroke and it comes to be near the end of the exhaust stroke, the exhaust valve should still be open and before top dead center, the intake valve uh, should start to open. <coughs> So the, the only way that this thing can make pressure in the cylinder ahead of the, ahead of the end of the exhaust stroke is if the cylinder is still, still sealed. And if you think about it, when this thing's going up on the exhaust stroke, in order to seal the cylinder, we know we're going to open the intake valve soon. So the exhaust valve must be closing early here in order to get um, pressure in the cylinder. Now when you take a look at it, let's get back out of here, then back in on it again. <clears throat> if we have a valve sealing problem, or not a valve sealing problem, but if we have a valve timing problem on the exhaust valve, which is what we have here, then we will also have a difference in pockets here, which is also what we have. So I've got two indicators here that the exhaust valve um, opening isn't where it should be. I've got a high pocket and I've got pressure in the cylinder before the end of the exhaust stroke. Both of those are really strong indicators that the exhaust valve on this thing um, is closing and opening early. Uh, Questions on this one before we move into the next waveform. Okay. So the next one. So this is a Dodge Journey uh, with the famous V6. This guy has an intermittent misfire, and this is from the cylinder that's not misfiring. So this cylinder is running normally, okay? And we just kind of did this uh, to get a feel for what this engine was like. <clears throat> get rid of my markers here or so that we can have a comparison to the bad cylinder. So I'm just gonna put my markers back on here just so we can kind of see everything. Add some rulers. Get rid of this. <clears throat> so this guy's making roughly 70 PSI compression at idle. Uh, pockets, that sort of thing, look pretty decent. Towers look fairly symmetrical. So this would be a, uh, well, we know for sure this is a good cylinder. It's not really doing anything. And now we're going to take a look at the bad cylinder. So this is the bad cylinder taken under the same conditions, which is basically a hot, no-load idle. And I'm just going to blow this up a little bit. <clears throat> 
And as I bring my measuring cursor down, <clears throat> we can see that the compression is a little bit uh, lower here, not dramatically, but a little bit. But we also see that we've got about a seven and a half PSI difference uh, in compression between the highs and the lows on this thing. And that happened over four compression strokes. So what that's telling me is that the compression on this thing is uneven. And you also notice here, it's kind of hard to see, but the compression on this thing tends to kind of follow a curve here. And if I pull this across, <clears throat> you can see this the curve kind of repeats itself over and over again. Now we get the odd little spike like that in here where the compression is even and then you're into the curve again. So what we've got here is inconsistent compression from this thing while the engine is running. And obviously we had to account for that. Now this isn't a ceiling issue. If you take a look at, uh, just drop, get in here a little bit. If you look at the pockets and where the valves are and all that kind of stuff, everything looks to be fairly decent. However, uh, we do have that up and down in compression to deal with. Right? You can actually see it here, some rulers on here. <clears throat> I measured the valve timing on this thing, trying to to sort of go through and figure out where the problems were with this thing and it was the valve timing was pretty consistent all the way through this thing uh, however we know that the cylinder is is filling in completely uh, because if the valve timing is fairly constant then airflow has to be the issue here and what we found when we when we got down to, to figuring out where this thing was broken was this thing had a roller rocker issue where the the, the, the bearing, the needle bearings in the roller rocker had actually um, worn out. And what was happening was as the roller rotated, it was hitting spots where it was making uh, good contact and other not making contact, but it was as it was rolling through the, uh, the roller was turning, it was actually changing height. And that was allowing the valve to uh, at times have more lift than others and you can actually you can see it in the waveform in the fact that the, the waveform is um, uneven indicating you know inconsistent airflow into the cylinder okay I got a couple more here that I want to go over um, so if there's any questions on this one I'll get them answered before we move into the next one Okay. So this is a Honda Civic uh, with a misfire. There's, there's some obvious problems here. So I'm just going to kind of chunk out a piece of this thing and we'll Sort of zoom in on a small section of it. So let me put some markers on that so we kind of know where we're at. Having said that, <clears throat> looking at the other waveforms, you don't have to 
look very hard to figure out that this thing's got some issues. Uh, obviously, we've got some inconsistent compression here. Uh, the compression varies on this thing from 135 down to uh, 108, which is about a 25 PSI swing in compression, which is not good. You can also see here, as we go up on the compression stroke, we actually drop compression a little bit, and then it continues on its way up. When we come down on the expansion stroke, uh, instead of expanding down into a vacuum, which is what we should be doing, we expand down to um, around zero PSI. And then on the intake stroke, we pull down into some vacuum. So I'm going to just go in and, and do some measurements on that. So I'm going to set uh, cursor one at zero. I'll bring the other guy in here to <clears throat> take a look at vacuum. So this thing's actually producing about 22 inches of vacuum in the cylinder on the uh, intake stroke, which is really good. Um, that tells me that the exhaust valve on this thing is sealing really well. Now, <clears throat> a couple of things here, and I'm just going to. Um, well, we'll talk about this bump first. In order to pull 22 inches of vacuum, uh, at least on, on, on the intake stroke, the exhaust valve has to be sealing fairly well. So I suspect we've got a problem with the intake valve here. So when we take a look at the compression, uh, obviously this bump down in compression is caused by air leaking out of the cylinder. Uh, I suspect that it is. Uh, being caused by the intake valve. <clears throat> the second thing that I see here, and I want to zoom in on this portion of the waveform here. So at the 360 degree mark, so 360. The intake stroke on this thing, which is not supposed to start until the vehicle, uh, until the engine goes past top dead center and the exhaust valve closes up is actually starting at about 20 degrees before top dead center of the intake stroke, which would indicate to me that the intake valve uh, isn't working properly. So on my, uh, in my opinion here, what we're dealing with <coughs> is really poor valve action on the intake valve as well as some some leak taking place on the intake valve as well okay so i'll stop and take questions on that one before we move into the next one i think we got one more So I've got a question here from Eric. Uh, by chance, was this car direct injection? Uh, no, it wasn't. This was an older Honda. Uh, I believe it was an 06 or an 07, but it does have VTEC on it. Um, unfortunately for us, we didn't get a chance to take this thing apart to actually see what it failed inside of it. Um, and the shop never called us back afterwards to let us know either. Yeah, it would be nice if it was a direct injection car. Unfortunately, it's not. I got a question here from Nick. What's the blur on the peaks? Uh, again, I'm pretty sure that's just poor ceiling. All right, one more and we'll call her a day. <clears throat> 
So this last one is a Mazda 6 uh, four-cylinder. Customer's complaint here is um, lack of power. Uh, this is a turbo car that really um, won't pull very well. It's had the uh, timing chains replaced. It had um, it's had the timing checked a couple of times. This is one of those engines where the um, what am I looking for? Where there's no timing marks on it. You you shove bolts and, and bars into the camshafts and into the to the crankshaft to lock them into place. There's a bolt that goes through the harmonic to lock it into place, and then you tighten everything up. And there was also some speculation as to whether the exhaust uh, was plugged on this thing. So I'm just going to show you the waveform here. I'll just zoom in on it a little bit, so get a bit of a look at it here. And we'll, we'll cover a couple of things off real quick. So it's making about 100 PSI of compression um, while it's sitting here idling. This is a VVT engine. Uh, variable valve timing on both banks. There are no valve timing codes in this thing. There is a code in it for cold idle performance, which we didn't investigate very hard because it wasn't taking us where we wanted to go. And <clears throat> there's nothing really obvious here. We were checking, one of the things we were looking at was uh, the exhaust. So I'm just going to I can't see my cursors here. So you can see my zero line there. So this is the exhaust stroke in through here. Uh, we've seen plugged exhaust on lots of cars with an in-cylinder pressure transducer. And generally what you get, if you do have a plugged exhaust, is this line will creep up in kind of a regular fashion as the cylinder goes up and makes more pressure. And that's definitely not happening here. So we know the exhaust isn't plugged on this car. <clears throat> the valve timing had been checked a couple of times and there were no cam crank correlation codes or variable valve timing codes or anything like that. So we weren't really too concerned uh, with that, not at this um, point in time anyway. We, this was a GDI with a turbo. Uh, we were pretty concerned with, uh, <clears throat> was it fueling properly? So the car was driven uh, watching fuel trims, which were uh, pretty good. They, they were off a little bit, but not much, certainly within what I would consider to be the normal range. We also watched, um, desired an actual fuel pressure real close while we were loading the car up and, and driving it under wide open throttle conditions and it fueled um, properly. Uh, it was making the pressure, I think we got a couple of thousand PSI out of it if I remember correctly. So we, we knew that there was a lot of stuff working okay with this car. So <clears throat> we kind of went through our racked our brains here as to why this thing uh, just wouldn't pull. And one of the things that we decided to check on this thing, and it very rarely gets checked these days on a car, was we decided to see where the ignition was firing. And how we did that was we used the pressure transducer to stake out where top dead center is. And then we used a second channel, in this case, channel two, so you, what you're looking at is cylinder number one, compression waveform, and this is cylinder number two, uh, or sorry, cylinder number one coil. So number one compression, number one coil. And I'm just gonna zoom in on this a little bit, get a better look at it. So right here at my zero mark is top dead center cylinder number one compression stroke and here's where the cylinder is firing. The cylinder is actually firing 
10 degrees after top dead center. This is the coil tray. So this is the coil turning on. This is the coil turning off. This is where it fires. It actually should be firing 15 or 15 or so degrees ahead of top dead center at idle, typically 15 to 20. And it's actually firing about 10 degrees after top dead center, which means the ignition timing on this thing is about 30 degrees late. <clears throat> anyway, to make a long story short, uh, what we found when we got into it, uh, obviously the only way the computer could fire the ignition late is if it doesn't know where the crankshaft is. And what we found on this car was a twisted, not a twisted, but the harmonic balancer, the tone ring uh, for the crank sensor gear had actually spun on the harmonic uh, about 30 degrees. So we, we got a new one, put it on, and the car fired right up and it's been fine ever since. So that brings us to the um, to the end of our uh, in-cylinder pressure transducer webinar. I'll take a few questions here and then uh, we'll call it a day. So uh, Nick Duncan uh, asked, when dealing with DVT systems, before you go in cylinder, do you disconnect the solenoids? Yeah, especially if we're going to do anything to do with measuring valve timing or that kind of stuff. The uh, VVT actuators are disconnected. Now, if we're going to drive the car, if we're watching for uh, VVT actuation or something like that and we want to measure it, then no, we don't disable it. But for the most part, if we're doing cam crank, sink, that kind of stuff on any kind of a VVT engine, uh, the VVT actuators are done. Uh, sorry, the VVT actuators are unplugged, then we start the car up. And I, I think everybody's kind of doing it that way, which makes sense uh, when you do the cam crank stuff to uh, <clears throat> have it so that the computer's not interfering with what you're trying to measure. We do that not only on the in-cylinder stuff, but when we're doing cam, cam crank correlation using the cam and crank sensor, we do the same thing. VBT is always disabled, taken out of the picture. And most of the waveforms that you see on like IETN and that kind of stuff are the same thing. And then I've got another um, <clears throat> uh, Nick says, I thought that EVO looked to be a little bit too late. Um, It is late compared to a fixed camshaft engine, but I, uh, without cam crank correlation codes on here, it wasn't really high on our radar. Um, if this was a push rod engine, for sure, I'd be looking at that a lot closer. That would, but if it was, if it was, if it was, um, if the if if the EVO was late, I would have some other indicators as well. I should have, um, if it's late because of a lifter issue or something like that. I should have some problems on the exhaust waveform as well. And I don't see that here um, in this area right here. It looks to be pretty flat. Most of the ones that we've seen where the EVO was late due to um, oh, rocker arm, camshaft issues, you get a bump in uh, cylinder pressure before the uh, end of the exhaust stroke. And I don't see that happening here. Plus, we didn't have any uh, VVT codes or any of that kind of stuff. And when we looked at the VVT cam timing with the scan tool, the desired and the actual were um, spot on and there was no variance. So that's kind of how we ruled that out, which is not obvious from this waveform. Um, I've also got uh, Eric here wants to see the waveform for the cylinder deactivation. So I'm just going to stop the share here while I go in and find that for him. Okay. Okay, can everybody, um, just a couple of guys, can everybody see the um, screen that says Diagnostics Mechanical Testing? Can you see that? Okay, perfect. So what you're looking at here 
is a cylinder that went from uh, full activation. You can see the waveform here on the left, where, um, give me a second here, where the cylinder is pumping normally with full valve action. This is the um, cylinder deactivation solenoid. This is a Dodge. And then as soon as the cylinder went deactivated, you can see how the waveform changed. If you, if you take a look at it, we have a uh, compression stroke or a compression spike twice as often. That's because the valves are closed, so the, the cylinder is, is compressing and decompressing constantly. Okay. Uh, I also had another question here. What are, what's the, the hashy stuff or the, or the wave the wavy stuff on the top of the exhaust waveform. Uh, basically, if you're looking at the exhaust pulse, when the exhaust valve is open, it is exposed to the exhaust manifold. So you've got um, exhaust slugs from other cylinders rushing past the port, which does create some slight pressure changes. So what you're seeing here with the with the exhaust valve open is pressure pulses from other cylinders in on the exhaust side of things, affecting that waveform a little bit. So that's that's kind of normal. Any other questions before we wrap it up? Uh, the question is, would a header lessen the waves? I don't think so, because the header goes into a collector. Um, and the idea behind a header is to help scavenge the cylinder. So you would, um, I've, I've never had this thing on a car with a header, but I would ex almost expect you would see more pulsations. Uh, but I, I don't know the exact answer to that, because I've never done it on a car with a header. And Dan said he missed what happened to the RAM. If he's talking about the RAM um, that had the misfire at high RPM, it was a bad cam load. Uh, does it make a difference what bank you start with for testing? Not really. Um, typically, you know, if you're in here testing with a pressure transducer, more often than not, you're looking for a misfire. So that would tend to, to have you do the, um, uh, the cylinder with the misfire on it. That would make sense as to where it starts. Um, sometimes it's not always easy to do that, given the engine layout and stuff like that today. Generally speaking, we don't, this isn't our first go-to tool. Um, we'll do a relative compression test with using starter current and, a, and, a, and an amp clamp. We'll do an intake trace on the intake manifold, to see how the engine is pumping, that kind of stuff. And then if we see anything that, that kind of says, you know, I've got a mechanical issue with this thing, then we'll, we'll put the in-cylinder pressure transducer in it to try and narrow it down. But just due to the fact that it's a, you know, it, it's, in a lot of engines, it's, it's hard to get it in there. I mean, you've got to take the coil out. Some of, the, some of these plugs and stuff are under intake manifolds and that kind of stuff. So it, it does change things. Um, uh, Eric says, do turbocharged, supercharged cars have varying waveforms? Um, most of this is done at idle, Eric. So the waveforms are pretty consistent. VVT has more of an effect. Now, um, when you whack the throttle, you're going to get more compression out of a turbocharged or a supercharged car because they can pack more air in. But for most of the stuff that we're doing here, these are just idle traces. A uh, turbocharger or supercharger is not going to have much of an effect on it because they're really not doing much at idle. Any other questions? Oh, am I going to make this recording available? Yes, anybody that signed up for the webinar will get a recording, not a recording, they'll get a link to this webinar uh, tomorrow. It'll come in into the email and there will be a link 
you can um, uh, click on the link. It'll take you to uh, a copy of this. You can download it. It's also going to be posted on our Facebook page, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, Auto Aid Technical Services, our YouTube channel. Our um, Facebook page is just Auto Aid, and it'll, it'll be up on both of those. It probably won't go up for a couple of days, but the link will be available tomorrow, and I'll email that out to you guys tomorrow. Perfect. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I hope you got lots out of it, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Mark. Take care. Have a good one, guys.